Um, oh, sorry, the recording's just started. Um, my name's Bruce McFarlane. I'm the CEO of the Blue Rock Group, for those of you I haven't met before. Um, so for those who haven't heard of Blue Rock, so we're an entrepreneurial advisory firm. Um, so what does that mean? Entrepreneurial advisory firm is, we've got two parts. So we've got a, a professional services part of our business where we provide accounting, legal, um, wealth management, finance, digital, and other services. And we've got an, entre uh, an investment part of our business where we co-invest and co-locate with a number of our um, clients, including in hospitality, property, and other areas. So um, we see a lots, we've got lots of people across that business. So we've got about 500 people in our hospitality business that we co-own and co-locate with, plus a couple of hundred people in the professional services business. Um, and plus a franchise group called Bell's Hot Chicken that we're part of as well. Um, today, we're fortunate we're partnering with now actually HR advisory firm and BDC Partners. So BDC Partners is a business that was set up last year to, to remove headaches for franchisors. But thank you for everyone joining today. Um, and for those of you who would love it if you turn your cameras on and participate, because we're, we're going to run this as much as possible, like a workshop as though we're all in the office. And so we're quite keen to... Uh, to have some discussion today. So, you know, if you're if you're up for it, um, and particularly the people like, unfortunately, like Mary Claire that I know, I'm gonna ask you a question at some point. So it'd be great if you can and join in. So that it's, uh, we're running, <laughs> there you are, welcome. See, I know, you got out of your tracksuit pants and everything. Um, for today, you know, working from home, it's fun. So we, today we're going to, to really deep dive into HR solutions and how franchisors can really assist and things for the franchisors, but how they can assist their franchisees. We're going to look at it from a few different perspectives. We've got Jenna in our panel, um, who's going to look at it from a HR advisory perspective. We've got Joe McCartney. So Joe's an accounting director. So we're looking at it from an accounting point of view and also lots of digital um, platforms. And then we've got Lisa Marie Parks and Lisa is a lawyer. So Lisa's going to be the bad cop on the session today and talk about when things aren't going so well, what, what happens then. Um, so for the session today, um, as you've heard, we're recording it. So if you do have to drop off, we can send you a link to the recording um, later on. And we are encouraging questions. So if you've got any questions, you can raise your hand. You can send um, a question through the chat. I think Rosie has posted in the chat. So if you've got something you'd like to ask, you don't want to ask it out loud, just send it through the chat. Um, and our panelists can also, you know, answer questions while they're not speaking. So we would like it to be as interactive as possible. So, but thanks again for joining. Um, so what we're going to do now is just start with Jenna. So we're going to talk about, you know, some of the, the HR advisory points of view. But so Jenna, from a, a HR perspective, you've got obligations um, as an employer. Do they fall on the franchisor or the franchisee or a combination of both? In short, Bruce, uh, it's actually a combination of both. So hi, everyone. Um, Jenna, as Bruce introduced, and when it comes to HR, a lot of people have different opinions on where the obligation falls, but truth is it can fall on both the franchisor and the franchisee. And the reason behind that is there's a couple of pieces of legislation within that. You've got the Fair Work Act, you've got the Franchise Code of Conduct, and you've got the Vulnerable Workers Act. So the Vulnerable Workers Act can be interpreted a few different ways, but essentially the responsibility for HR matters can come back on you as a franchisor. So for example, if there is an underpayment going on within your network, not only the franchisee as a business owner and a director and employer in their own right is going to be liable for that underpayment as an example, it can also come back on you as the franchisor. And so that's really important to make sure that you do support your network with the right mechanisms when it comes to HR so that you risk uh, mitigate any risk that may be present. So, um, you know, with everything when it comes to law, there's interpretation and the best practice is that it's on both and it's all about education and making sure that we're providing the tools, resources and support um, to support our network so that we do stay out of the limelight. Um, it also helps with things like brand reputation and things 
as such that we'll talk about a bit later on. So Bruce, yes, HR does fall on both the franchisee and the franchisor. So what HR structures should franchisors have in place to support their network then? Yeah, for sure. So it's really important, for example, we're working with a emerging franchise at the moment. So their, their approach is to be proactive rather than get a whole heap of franchisees join their system and then be re reactive down the track. So what we're doing for them, for example, is setting up all the documentation and the templates and support when it comes to HR, putting together the a right pay rate, um, employment contracts, workplace policies, employee handbooks, a HR operations manual, training modules on how to recruit or how to run um, a HR function in your business. Because generally the franchisees are really good at running their business, but like many small business owners, we wear multiple hats, but you can't be an expert in every area. So if the franchise or has these um, documents and structures and manuals on their local system for the network to use, they can sit back feeling comfortable that things are up to date. If there's a change in legislation, for example, that it impacts an employment contract, you go in from a central perspective, update the template and then share it with the network. Um, so that's from that setting the foundations up. And then you go to the franchises that are larger. We've got a network, several franchisees. Now it's really important for one of our clients, for example, we are their HR. So the franchisees and head office have access to us, not only from a documentation templates, making sure that they're record keeping and everything correctly, but to pick up the phone and say, hey, I've got an issue with this person. It's a disciplinary matter. I don't know what to do. Or I need to terminate. Can I just tap them on the shoulder and move on? Well, no, you can't. And Lisa will talk about that a bit later. Um, so having that advice line there to support your clients. And when I say advice line, not just a 1300 number going to someone that doesn't know your business, but personalized tailored support that is consistent and that your HR support knows the bigger picture on where the business is going from a strategic perspective. It can keep the franchisees happy and it can keep the uh, franchisors happy. So they're kind of the, the main things that we like to have in place from a, a HR structure perspective. Yeah, and so some of the people on the call from bigger systems, I'm assuming like Daisy, for example, you'd be providing that role, that support for franchisees as well based at head office? We're actually not at the moment, interestingly enough. When I joined Careers Please, my role was Greenfield. Uh, there was no HR before me. So over the years since I've joined, I've been building out the HR for the direct employed strategy. Um, and we provide uh, support in terms of engagement, communications and safety to our franchise network. But the actual employment, um, given that we don't have any shared payroll systems where we have line of sight at the moment, we haven't gone too deep into that. But it's definitely something that we're wanting to do. Yeah. And what about you, Mary Claire? Do you, you have... HR at head office that helps the franchisees or is it something that you outsource as well? No, so actually, uh, funny enough, we don't have anything in head office for HR for direct staff. Yeah. However, we have um, put a lot of um, resource into growing um, our, a structure for our franchise partners to be able to use um, and assisting them with payroll. So we do payroll audits randomly. We do payroll audits prior to a business selling. Yep. Um, and yeah, we again we have the the HR manuals. We've got the uh, contracts for our franchise partners to be able to use. So yeah, there is a little bit in place, but again, it's just a it's a minefield because again, you can only have line of sight what you can see. Yeah, it's tricky. What about you, Ben? You um running it out of head office, or are you? Uh, no, we're we're currently outsourcing all of it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we've got um, business partners whereby our franchisees or even the franchisor can call these people directly um, in relation to any employment matters that may arise. Um, and we also have like a, um, an onboarding and contract type software program where um, we update all the templates and maintain them and we encourage the franchisees to, to utilise them for recruiting casual and full-time staff. 
Yeah. Um, and we also um, use ER strategies to do um, generally six monthly payroll audits. And we sort of cherry pick something that we want to sort of get a, get a better understanding of. Um, so for example, um, last year we did them on people's um, classifications. This year we'll be doing them on um, casual contracts and also um, hourly rates as well to make sure people are taking all of that into account. Yeah. Um, sorry, just an admin thing. I'm seeing everyone that's coming through is, uh, Nikita, is Nikita who works in our office. So <laughs> if anyone's not Nikita and you don't change, if you can change your name, that would be great. I'm not 100% sure why that's happening, but uh, <laughs> um, we're going to have lots of Nikitas here. Um, and so, Jenna, what about... Like, why do you think they sh franchisors should invest in a HR structure and support? Yeah, that, that's a really good question because there's quite a number of factors. One of them is risk mitigation, protecting yourself um, as the franchisor, but also the franchisees protecting themselves for any fair work claims or any other claims that can come when it comes to employment. So it's minimising that risk and it's all about to... It's all about education. So my approach on HR is educate those around. So educate your HQ, educate your franchisees because the more knowledge that we can pass on, the less risk of things going wrong. So that's one of the, the, the main reasons. It's also best practice. So there's so many competing brands in the market. We all wanna be employer of choice. These days, it's really hard to find good talent, but to retain them is even harder, especially when it becomes to the millennial generation because people aren't here to stick around for 10, 15 years what they may used to be. They're always looking for that next move. So if you have things in place, that helps from a best practice and also brand reputation. You know, the franchise network itself, there's a lot of stigma out there. So if you can be a leading brand and making sure that you have the right support mechanisms, just like you have your marketing fund, HR is no different. Um, it just goes to creating a good quality brand and protecting yourself and those within the network. So I think they're the, the main reasons why they should invest and also the employment framework within Australia is known to be one of the most complex in the world. There's a ridiculous number of awards. It's hard for professionals to interpret, let alone the general business person, that it's not their expertise. So it's a bit like I would never run my own tax return because that's not my area. So it's knowing when to put your hand up and step aside. And that's why franchise systems should have this type of support in place. And it just all goes to quality control as well. And what about some examples where you've you've had to assist um, either franchisees or franchisors in those sort of tricky examples? Yeah, for sure. So um, Ben spoke about casuals. So uh, in 2018, there was rules that came into place with casual employment and then they've become even tighter in March this year. So, for example, one of the um, major things with some of our clients, we've got a large casual base. So it's making sure that they understand the casual conversion process. So an example of that is we give them advice. They come to us also with questions about, I've got employee X, are they a casual by true nature or should they be a part-time or full-time person? And how do I go about making these changes, having the conversation? So we're all about educating and giving our clients more knowledge and confidence to have those conversations. Also comes down to if there's say a disciplinary matter, you might have someone that has really high absenteeism and it's got to the point you've tried the, the soft touch, it needs to be a bit more formal. So what is the proper process you've got to go through to if you get do get to the other side and there is a claim that you've done all the steps correct, but how to have those conversations, what it all means is really important so there's some of the things that we get called on on a daily basis um and just general people matters um Susanna I'm going to throw to you so you um I know you've worked with lots of different franchise systems over the journey so what about some examples from you like where you've you know assisted franchisee matters as well yeah look we biggest thing that I find is that HR is not something major that lots of people would find it's a, a need. Um, so they try to 
cut corners if they can and if they could back in the days. Um, we're finding now that it's looking like something that they're going to take, they're taking more seriously and they're looking at auditing um, a lot of their franchisees. Not so much to do about seeing if they're doing the wrong thing, but just to keep them, it's educating them and it's what they don't know that they need to know to be able to put best practices in place. And I guess um, that side of things is where a lot of the franchisors and I are, are wanting to be within and know, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what about sort of from the positive side? Obviously, a lot of, you know, HR work is, is on the negative side of things, is helping where there's a tricky situation. But what about on the positive side? So, Jenna, how, do you, how have you helped, you know, with the franchisors to really drive engagement with the franchisees? Yeah, and that, that's a good question because, like you said, a lot of the negativity, HR is seen as negative. You just hire and fire and you don't do too much else. Um, whereas there's a lot of good stuff you do. So I mentioned before the, the employee uh, employer of choice, so brand recognition, making sure that you have things in place like reward and recognition rewarding and recognising staff that are doing a good job. A simple, say, staff member of the month, a $50 voucher to the movies or something like that can go a really long way. So having that focus, having health and wellbeing in place, mental health is really um, on a priority list at the moment for organisations, so recognising that. Having things in place like an employee assistance program, an EAP, so that your um, employees, management also have access to reach out someone to talk to in a confidential safe space. Um, putting in place a whistleblower hotline. Uh, training and development is a big one. So you might not actually be able to uh, give that employee their $10,000 wage increase that they're requesting, but you might be able to put them through some training that is going to increase their knowledge overall and make them feel good, but also add value to your organisation because you're getting a highly skilled, a more highly skilled individual. And it also doesn't have to come with a cost from an external perspective. It might be bringing the more, um, the more junior staff along to meetings that senior staff are involved in to expose them. I know when I was coming up, when my managers used to bring me to meetings that I wasn't necessarily meant to be at, it was a warm and fuzzy because it's like, oh, I get to go to this important meeting and learn and get exposed, which essentially is professional development, which goes a long way. So there's some of the things that's really important that um, organisations think about to, to take them to that next level and stand out from the rest. Um, one of the things you mentioned then was uh, employee assistance, so EAP. So is that something like, Belinda, is that something you've had at Explore and Develop or is it EAP? I know you're not Nikita, but... <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure why I'm Nikita. Um, Everyone's Nikita when they join. We're just, we're starting a cult. Okay, fabulous. All right, I'll run with that. Um, yeah, we have an employee um, access EAPs and assistance program that we've had running with our all of our franchisees and their staff for... Oh, probably four or five years now, I would say. And um, it's amazing. Every year we um, we get, it's obviously a confidential service, but we get the reports that come in to show usage. And, um, yeah, it, it, it really, in terms of, you know, you get codes to say why people have called um, and probably 80% or 90% of the calls are not work-related as to why they need to access the service, their personal reasons. But... Um, in most cases, they state that it was affecting their job performance, um, you know, if they're going through a marriage breakdown or what have you. And so, um, yeah, the ability to be able to support a staff member through those uh, difficult situations and then have them still not miss work and be productive members at work and, and stay with you long term is really invaluable. Yeah, I think lots of brands, I'm not sure, Daisy, you're nodding there, but lots of brands during, you know, probably Curious Place is a different example, but over the last 12 months with COVID and, you know, I know we did a quite a bit of work, Phil's there from Retail Zoo, but lots of, you know, their businesses were shut, their business owners, you know, trying to deal with the, the stress of being a business owner, um, even the staff. But so, Daisy, did you, have you got an EAP at Curious Please? Yeah, we do have an EAP and we've seen uptake increase significantly over the last 12 months. And uh, the other thing we've done, Hannah from my team's on the call, she's yeah. been really great at really breathing life into mental health and well-being. Uh, we're in a predominantly male uh, work environment. A lot of our franchi franchisees are predominantly male, so not a topic that 
um, historically they've been very forthcoming and engaging with, but we've had some really great campaigns in that space and uh, we've seen a difference. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think to your point, um, Bruce, it's also for the managers as well. A lot of the EAP have managed for assist because not only for their personal side of things, but they're struggling to keep that smile on their face, deal with the life, for example, of COVID, it's one example, or restructures or whatnot. And they're taking on, as managers and business owners, you probably go, I'm taking on the stress and the pressure of my staff because they're stressed, they're coming to me, which you're only human, you've only got a capacity. So making sure that you understand it as managers and business owners, it's okay to reach out to them as well. So a lot of EAPs have that manager assist hotline, which I think is just as important to promote as much as it is important for staff. Um, thanks, Jenna. I'm going to move change topic a little bit now. So moving from uh, mental health to accounting, Joe. So that drives me a little bit mental when I have to do my accounts. But uh, let's, so from an accounting and HR systems point of view, how do you think that you can, uh, they can assist in driving efficiency um, in the franchising world? Thanks, Bruce. I think there's three clear parts to this. So there's the first part, getting the data in. So is there an opportunity there to automate some of the manual HR tasks and compliance requirements, taking up your HR person's function? Can we create a self-service for employees as well? Um, so for example, with the setup of employees, is it a system that they can actually enter their data in as well, which will help with data hygiene purposes, as well as cleaning up uh, cleaning up to make sure that there's no typos, errors, that sort of thing when someone else is actually entering that data. So the idea is to free you up um, so that you can focus on those, those nice things that Jenna was talking about, creating an employer of choice, um, focusing on the culture and the employee well-being. Another one is, is the policies and procedures and storing of the documentation. Another one is tracking things like training. So for us, we have CPD requirements. Understand for a lot of hospitality, they might have OHS, RSA, first aid requirements. So making sure that all of that data is captured in that one central space. The second part is utilizing the system and actually managing the data. And this could be at either the franchisee or franchisor level. So again, for an employee, can they have visibility over their own data? I think back to when I was working um, as, a, as a bookkeeper before I um, ventured into the world of public practice and the number of queries I'd get from employees of, can you tell me what my leave balance is? Can you tell me when I last had um, a pay increase, I need to fill out a rental application. Um, can I bring in my, my paper approved leave, or leave form that I've had to get my manager to physically sign and then we enter into the system. So that self-service component um, I think would be really beneficial. The second part is for the manager or the franchisor, and that's having visibility of things like leave and employee information. And can you set it up so that you've got some push notifications and email reminders? So for example, next week, just a reminder, you've got this person on leave. Um, don't forget Friday, it's this person's birthday. All of those little things that just help you keep connected with your team um, can really help with the culture. The third one is at either the, or it might be at the franchisee level as the owner, or it might also be at the franchisor level. And that's the, the document management platform for policies, surveys, running an employee net promoter score survey, for example. Can you shoot that out through, through your platform? Running things like surveys so that you can have a look at trends among specific locations or teams, um, integration, so awards with um, award updates, as Jenna mentioned, the, the employment law um, program in Australia is one of the most complex, dealing with a, the ever-changing awards and that sort of thing. Is there a way that you can get that out across your whole system really easily? Also, can there be things like if you've got employees coming up to the casual conversion, um, can we shoot out a proactive email um, to, to the team so that they can convert those people over or go through the process that they need to? 
So having it set up as a more push notification sort of program rather than a reactive audit coming in later going, oh, whoops, we didn't realise this, we forgot about that, um, can really drive some efficiencies. The last point is getting data out into a format that you can actually provide insights and analyse. So both Daisy and Marie Claire spoke about line of sight. Um, one of the biggest problems is, and, and we were speaking to one of the clients that came to yesterday's session, they had six systems to manage their employees. So they had to log into six different things to find, to, to be able to actually look at the data. And if it's really, if it's only more than two, you're not going to bother. So having a tool that can aggregate that data for you, so you've got one central location to view it, um, is, is really important. And it can be for both financial and non-financial data. So some of the non-financial data might be the length of tenure for the, for the employees. It might be, is a particular store having trouble with, uh, with staff turnover and engagement? Is there something there that the franchisor can provide some assistance to that franchisee to help them build up that culture um, and, and reduce the staff turnover? Um, and so what sort of problems have you seen, um, Joe, with the clients and the franchisors with, you know, using different systems and all of this besides having too many? <laughs> yes. So the, the inefficiency, um, obviously having too many and um, having that data input time where you've got multiple systems and you need to enter it into each of the systems rather than having that data integration so that it can actually push between the systems um, is really important. So um, being able to push things through like leave balances, leave requests, access pass pay slips, having appropriate API between the systems it can really help free up the time that you can then spend on analysing the data and making good use of it. Another one is the access and utilisation. So it's important that people have appropriate access for their level or for their role. We want to ensure that people can self-service and that team leaders have and franchisees have oversight over their team as well. Um, but if we've got a data aggregation service, we don't necessarily want to want each franchisee to be able to see each other. So having that appropriate level of access is really important. And then the under the number of times that we hear, oh, we should we use this program, but we probably only use twenty percent of it. So that under underutilization um, of software is another big problem um, that we see. And so then. Training, that's a training or an implementation plan or yeah that's right and we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later as to things that you need to consider when you are trying to roll out these um these systems as part of a change management piece but it but yeah it is a really important part and what about on the positive side of things so to drive performance and, and profitability at the franchisee level so what what sort of steps um should franchisors take yeah, so again, it needs to be in a format that you can do that. So that, uh, that data aggregation piece is really important as that can be really powerful when it's rolled up and you're just looking at single dashboards um, for your franchisees or franchisors to be able to keep a finger on the pulse and identify gaps. Uh, for key insights, can they be set up so that they're, they're actually pushed out to you? So the system's not actually a set and forget. For example, each month, the employee turnover reports automatically get emailed from the system to the appropriate people so that the information is literally put in front of people without anyone actually having to do anything. And that will free them up to have a look at things like engagement. So looking at their exit data, why are people leaving? Have we got terminations or redundancies or are they not the best fit? Or is there an engagement problem in that site? or that franchisee that we need to give them some help with. Also being able to compare across the franchisees. So which ones are your high performers and why is that the case? Which ones are struggling and could use some help? And what have they got that they could potentially learn off some of those ones that are doing much well, much, sorry, much better, <laughs> much well, doing well today. So te yeah, technology can provide employee empowerment to help drive that automation, particularly where there's that self-service 
um, component. And we want to make sure that, uh, as we said, things can be where there's um, duplication of roles that could also be removed. So we've just got one person that enters the data in one time, doesn't have to go in multiple systems by multiple different people, which, which inevitably leads to errors. And there's nothing worse than, you know, receiving an automated email or a, a notification and your name spelt wrong, uh, or little things like that. Just removing that out can really be helpful. Thanks, Joe. I'm going to just throw to a few people just to see what how they're going with it at the moment. So, Kelly, um, welcome. How's thing City Cave? So, what sort of systems do you have in place from a technology point of view, and and how do they work for you? Hi there. Um, we're actually quite new to the technology side of things, especially in HR. We've only just implemented a system called IWS, which is an automated payroll system for all our franchisees. But I'm only new to City Cave. I've been here yeah. three months and I'm currently in the process of um, rolling out our five-year plan because we definitely need some technology behind us. Yep. I think people think we're a lot bigger than we actually are. <laughs> and we've only got about eight head office staff. So to have a HR person in um, in houses, they're very lucky yep. in that sense. But um, we're starting to delve into everything like that because we really need to automate it. I'm filling out a lot of Excel spreadsheets at the moment. <laughs> Fantastic, Joe. Joe can help you with the spreadsheets. What about yeah. you, Matt? What sort of uh, <laughs> tech systems have you got in place, Nurse Next Door? Um, so yeah, look, we've got a few things that we're that we're running at the moment through our so we use op central as our sort of intranet um and and obviously you can customize that so we find that's really good i suppose um we got that centralized position where we can look in at a at a location level and uh, look at compliance in terms of people doing um pre-employment reading and training and things like that for OHMS, manual handling, all of those sorts of things, which are particularly, you know, obviously manual handling is a big one for us, um, but, uh, you know, infectious diseases and things like that. So, yeah, look, I mean, I, I think we're still, obviously, you know how fast we're growing. And so we're still sort of grappling with um, our head office staff as well too and having enough people. We do have a sort of a HR people experience who was working mostly in our Melbourne corporate office, um, who's sort of shifting into more of a, a role to support our franchisees as well. Um, and so it's just sort of getting some of those systems tightened up a bit. But um, yeah, I think a lot of those automations and things like that certainly make things easy for our franchisees that they can go in at, at any one level, see where their team is at in a snapshot for, you know, who's completed all of the different um uh, modules on, on on whether that be pre-employment or um, you know they've done if it's a specific sort of uh, delegation that they want to be able to do from a nursing perspective or something like that for a caregiver. So yeah, um, and, and obviously yeah we have a lot of um, the, the centralised letters of engagement things like that as well too that people are talking about where we try and only update one. Uh, template and then push it out to the system uh, and things like that. Um, with that op central, one of the things I really like about op central is that when we do have a shift, so obviously it's all um, the levels of access are graded. Um, so to either you know franchise partners or um, all caregivers, you know different levels of management within each business or whatever. But if we have a system wide uh, policy change that we need to push out, um, which is perhaps based on legislation or something like that um, and, and maybe is healthcare related. Uh, if we need to, you know, we can push out the policy. Everyone gets an, we can alert people. Everyone gets the email. If it's particularly sensitive, we can attach a quiz to it so that they would have to read the policy to be able to answer the, the questions in the quiz. And then it's date and time stamp, So we know, and we can keep pushing it out to them on a daily or weekly basis, you know, depending on how urgent it is that we want to get it read. But so at least for our franchisees, they all know that if they ever get audited on that sort of thing, they've got that compliance level, um, you know, uh, documented quite well. So. What about you, Ben? Have you got a few different systems or from a HR perspective, a technology system? Uh, yeah, we have got a few. Um, we try where we can to integrate them via the APIs yeah. Um, but as we sort of found, like we might find a really good system today um, and that might not necessarily integrate into a system that we've got. 
So then we have to sort of work out, well, how good is the, uh, even if it's not a legacy system, how good is the other system that we've got that we're using? And do we have to look at, you know, changing multiple systems so they continue to talk to each other? Um, so, you know, we use Flare HR for like employment contracts and onboarding. Yeah. Um, rolled out um, deputy for time and attendance. So we can sort of get um, some information linking between the two. Um, but then uh, I suppose a higher um, priority we put on putting in deputy is the benefit of that sending straight through to, to zero for the payroll. Um, so we sort of put a higher importance on the data integrity from you know deputy to zero that we did on have, having everything sort of syncing between Flair HR and Deputy, for example. Yeah. Um, so we also use um, our point of sale system for sending timesheet data through so we can run daily reports on you know, cost of goods and cost of labour. Um, so I think that's always a challenge that we have. We can find a really good system, um, but you know, even when we're scoping it out, how much additional work is it to get all of those integrations happening? Um, because you know, things like the point of sale system you don't want to lose, you know, six years worth of data because it is right down to that transactional level. Yeah. Um, so sometimes we just make the decision, look, down the track, hopefully we can integrate it. But for now, we'll sort of wear a certain aspect of, you know, a manual procedure, but we try and limit that as much as we can. Yeah, cool. Joe, and what about you? What sort of some of the systems that the, the franchising clients are using or that you've seen that have been successful? Yeah, it depends on what you're actually trying to achieve. I find that a lot of people dive into a software without taking that step back to work out what the end game actually is. The other point that Ben made is the software is moving so quickly. One that's, you know, right for today might not be right for tomorrow. One that you looked at, you know, a year ago might now be fantastic for you. So I think where you can engage with a digital specialist that can help guide you down that path, I think that can be really beneficial. The ones that we have, have seen a fair bit of with our franchise clients, in terms of onboarding, we look at things like workable Flare Freshworks, which you can manage your recruitment, um, staff moving between stores, onboarding and, and that sort of thing. Um, and some of those um, particularly workable is a self-service one as a starting point. Um, moving to the employee management part, things like Happy HR, Bamboo, Employment Hero, Enable HR um, can really help free up that time and some of those integrate with that, those initial programs that I was talking about. So again, they'll, they'll push that data across and you only have to deal with it one time. In terms of um, POS systems that we can then push through, so data from things like Lightspeed or Counter, uh, for rostering, de Deputy seems to be the, the pretty clear winner in a lot of people's books um, for that timesheet and attendance. Um, the Having it integrate where possible with the accounting software, so Zero or Myob, and then something that can actually pull it all together. So again, that data aggregation tool, like Spotlight Multi or maybe a um, Microsoft Power BI that can help with some consolidated performance reporting and benchmarking. And what about, you know, I know you see a lot of this from the accounting point of view is when people are trying to integrate software with, with a Myob or Zero, and some of the problems of, or some of the solutions with integrating and then, you know, what the challenges they have with different systems. Yeah, so you've got you've got two parts of it. You've got the actual systems and whether the API is there for them to be able to actually integrate um, or whether you need workarounds for that. And then you've got the human component. So the adoption of new, which is generally a bit a bigger piece. So the technology adoption needs to start at the top, but it really requires having champions on the ground. So within the actual franchisees that are part of that training and development program and get the chance to build the knowledge and drive the training and support within their teams. Um, an example that, that I've used before is within our teams, I mean, we use Zero a lot across our accounting business um, and we've got about 10 smaller accounting teams 
Within each of those, there is what we've termed a zero hero, and they're responsible for rolling it out within the team. So yes, we've got someone overseeing it, but you've got to have some of that knowledge in the, and push from the, the people on the ground. So when you're preparing to launch, have you consulted all of your stakeholders? Um, ensure that you've got a training and rollout plan as it's really important to make sure your users, one, are on board, but two, will be equipped to use the program um, to its full efficacy. We recently just rolled out uh, Workable in, in our business and we just rolled it out to one or two directors to start with so that we could flush out all of the problems um, and all of the questions that were going to be coming up so that when we rolled it out to the bigger group, we could say, right, heads up, you need to do it this way because of this. If you're trying to do this, click here, um, enter it in this way. If you're looking for this data, it's over here to just sort of cover off that, the cover off the initial objections that you're likely to get from a new user. If you can go through that you've actually and demonstrate that you've, you've considered their needs, thought about some of the issues and covered that off to start with, you've got a much better chance of engagement. So yeah, do a test run with one of the stakeholders to work out what any of the issues are and then make sure that you're providing that ongoing support to the champions within the business. Thanks, Joe. Um, so we're gonna move away from positive stuff, just to negative at the moment, to bad cop, Lisa, to talk about some of the, the ch HR challenges. So Lisa, as a, as a lawyer, you know, you deal with not often the uh, when things haven't gone so well, what are the common hurdles that you see from franchisors? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the amount of times I've picked up the phone and it's at the curly end when it when um, things have hit the fan um, and advice is needed. Um, and by that point in time, to be honest, it's what the franchisors are looking for is not where we want to know what to do right and do that. It's it's hit a point in time where they're looking for an outcome to 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 try conclude the matter um, and 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 really giving that advice and saying this is what you were supposed to do sometimes comes at a shock to people um, so it's interesting from my perspective and um, really important for franchisors um, with their franchisees that education is a huge part to avoid picking up the phone to me at the end um, so having those systems in place and for example Ben you talked about um, like hygiene checks every six months that is so important because education and being on top of the problem um, is, is, is a fantastic way to get um, a resolution because to be honest things aren't always going to get right even if you've got these systems in place um, but if you've done the right things along the way, have the right records um, and have complied with the law, you'll find that resolving that tough matter at the end is a lot easier. So, yeah, I find one of the common hurdles is um, not being aware of what you need to do and how that needs to be done. Um, the second issue I find is when do I as the franchisor intervene? Um, I find that um, there might be a matter going on with their franchisees and it's a question of when do we get involved, do we even get involved and how can we get involved? Um, so that's all, always an important question for um, brand protection. Um, so there are some franchisors who go, well, I don't really feel like this is my problem and I've only heard about this because the employee of the franchisee has picked up the phone and called head office. Um, but I always think that you need to get on the ground, get the boots dirty and, and solve the problem um, because the last thing we want is the name flashed up in the media um, and you'll have better brand, uh, better brand um, protection that way as well. So, Probably those are the most common hurdles I find um, when talking to franchisors. And probably a common one, Lisa, is around underpayment allegations and which comes up both, you know, more likely uh, at a franchisee level, but sometimes at a franchisor level as well. So, you know, how do you deal with those sorts of situations? 
Yeah, well, absolutely. We can't turn a, a blind eye to it. Um, it's, it's prime. Everybody knows about it. Um, and it was ripe in the media for a long time. Um, and there was, there was a bit of name and shame, unfortunately, that, that went on, um, even if um, the franchise or slash franchisees believed they were doing the right thing. Because as Jenna said, the, the awards are complicated. Um, and just by way of example, I had one who um, was paying in accordance with the award. They just weren't paying on the right award. So they got incredibly confused. They, they thought they should be on the restaurant award. They should have been on the hospitality award. And because of that, um, because of that small thing, which is a big thing, but because of that thing, they, we had to go back six years um, and, and, and recalculate um, everybody's pays, which was a big mammoth task. And as you can imagine, that's a lot of legals, that's a lot of accounting, um, and that's a big um, hit to the hip pocket, where if you've put these um, measures in place and are you doing your regular hygiene checks, if something, if you have, um, if there has been a discrepancy, it can be easily rectified and you can do it in a timely manner without being also pinged by um, some of the um, penalty um, penalty um, rates that apply um, if you late lodge. Um, so I think um, it's, it's really important um, to be on the forefront and understanding what award you're on checking that the classifications, because employees, uh, their qualifications, their experience, their duties, as those things change, their classification under the award will change. And being on top of that is incredibly important. Um, being on top of uh, rate increases as well. Um, so those things, if they're done at the time, will make life a lot easier and communication between the franchisor and the franchisee is going to make that process incredibly easy, easy when you educate people, um, once you're educated yourself as well. So Mary Clay, you've got a, lot, a number of restaurants across different brands and uh, is this come up for you and how have you managed it as the in-house lawyer? Yeah, so it comes up a lot for us. Um, we get, we've done a hotline where um, staff can contact us um, and you can actually choose. You can choose to uh, send the email to the chairman, the CEO or our training slash HR or you wouldn't call it HR manager, but yeah, training manager. Um, so we deal with that straight away and we're of the opinion that it is brand damaging for us. It may, we may not have any liability to it, but at the end of the day, it's our company, our name that's going to be in the media, not the actual end franchisee. Um, and so we just jump on it straight foot, straight away, get a BDM out there, interview staff, um, um, get them to do a, um, an audit check. Um, the audit check is a sample check. I make them go back three months. If then something gets found out, I actually then am um, of the opinion, obviously it's been happening for some time, and I make them go back to when the staff actually started um, working at the restaurant. So it, it, for me, it's huge. It's not something to be taken light, um, lightly because it can um, damage our reputation. And again, nobody goes into a job not wanting to get paid properly. And we, like we're saying, the fast food award is insane. Um, there's so many loopholes. You don't even want to try and um, cover one up because you'll find another one. Um, and it's just, you know, at the end of the day, it's just assisting... Um, franchisee and the young kids that work in our restaurants yeah and it's like it's not like the franchisors or the franchisees are, are normally trying to make yeah. it on purpose it's not wage theft as it gets branded in the media it's actually just mistakes but uh, simple they, things like laundry allowance a lot of them believe that you know I, you know if i wash their if i wash their t-shirt does that mean that i've still got to pay them technically no but you know it's just there are so many ins and outs that you know it, it's just got to be looked after Daisy, the same, you know, with you uh, have the same challenges with with the careers and the, their their employees. We have a, um, an interesting situation that a lot of our franchisees don't employ anyone; they're owner operators. Um, but Ziggy, who's on the call, he's in our franchisee compliance and management team, and it's something that we're working together on to get a lot more visibility and oversight on, um, because at the moment. 
yeah, we really don't know the extent of what's happening with our franchisees' employees. Uh, being a career company, often the franchise is an owner-operator driving a van. So it's a big stream of work that we're looking at commencing. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? And Belinda, I know this is another one, challenging one for you as well. The uh, childhood, you deal, how do you deal with your uh, underpayment if that's come up for your franchisees? Yeah, we have we have a really tricky awards system um, as well, um, and um, yeah, again, there's no never ever a deliberate underpayment, but there has been occasions when um, people have been on the the wrong awards. So we just take the approach as a franchise all through our benchmarking to identify if anyone, um, if their percentage of um, turnover seems too low, um, to investigate and. Um, yeah, we've had the fair work work modules that are available. We've made those mandatory in our system. So our franchisees all need to have completed those. Um, and we also have an amazing HR IR advisory service <laughs> through, through Blue, Blue Rock. Actually, we've actually just switched. We used an extra, another company for a number of years and we've just switched that over um, to use Lisa Marie mostly um, in Blue Rock, which is fantastic. So that's been a great change for us as well. So we actually act as the advice line for our franchisees if they've got queries in relation to, um, you know, often it's parental leave in our sector. Um, and so we have somebody in-house who's, who's on top of all of that and who will reach out through Blue Rock to get advice where we need to so that we hopefully are not having those issues down the track that people are getting the right advice through in terms of whether it's um, you know, performance management or payment or any of those, um, those issues. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a tricky. The under, underpayment one is the one that seems to cause a lot of the problems. What about another one, Lisa, terminating employees? So, you know, people understanding the process where whether it be in head office or whether it be franchisees, how, how have you assisted, you know, franchisors in managing that process? Yeah, absolutely. So if we look at um, just the um, management of um, performance and conduct issues as a, as a termination point, because um, obviously there's, there's others, um, but like I said, I, I, so I pick up the phone and it's to the point where it's gotten so bad that the franchisor or franchisee says to me, I want to, I want to terminate them today. And I will say to them, have you had conversations about them with them and to try and improve the performance, given them examples, consulted with them, put in mechanisms in place to assist them to get better um, had a support person present um, when I have, do they know their jobs at risk? When I have those conversations, a lot of the time I get back no, or yeah, we've had a couple of conversations. They're verbal. I haven't documented them. And I didn't really get into the nitty gritty because, you know, I wanted everything to still be okay. And I didn't want to upset the employee. So, I mean, that's worst case scenario, but I pick up the phone to a number of those conversations. So um, it's really important um, that the proper processes are followed um, simply because anybody can make a claim. This is the, the chief fact. It's really simple to make a claim in fair work for um, unfair dismissal or a general protections claim. Um, so the, the, the idea around this is to, to, to be defensible, to do the right thing um, so that if a claim is made, which you, you, you can't stop if an employee is extremely litigious, um, the idea that you can say to the Fair Work um, uh, Tribunal member and before that the conciliator, we have done everything that we were required to do. We consulted with the employee, we documented our consultations, we put proper mechanisms in place to help the employee improve, um, which could be training, could be supervision, it could be hiring more staff, um, could be regular check-ins, whatever's decided. Um, we've consulted, they understood what needed to be improved or what conduct was, was a big no-no for our organisation. Um, um, that you know, that they knew that their job was at risk and by the end we had a support person present and they knew exactly why they were there and the reason why we had to unfortunately show them the door. So that's a really important thing 
um, to be able to do and to know what to do during the time. Yeah. And Jenna, what about you, Jenna? Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to add to what Lisa's saying. For an employee to lodge a claim, it costs as little as $74.50. And I don't think employees understand how easy it is for them to lodge a claim. They can essentially make up whatever they want to say and then it's the employer that has to defend it, right, wrong or in between. It has to be defended. You can't turn around saying no. It costs them time, money, stress, brand damage. Um, an employee can represent themselves or a lot of people, Lisa and I were talking yesterday, go to no fee, no win, no fee lawyers type of scenario. And then if they do get some type of compensation, they get that 7450 back. So it's really important to understand how easy a claim is to be made. Yeah, lots of fun um, and lots of <laughs> lots of fun to try and get out. So Ben, have you uh, <laughs> had to manage this one? Uh, through the franchisees, um, we've sort of got an arrangement with our external HR sort of help desk where if it really gets to the to the pointy end and they're concerned that the franchisee is going to terminate sort of unlawfully or that, you know, it's going to escalate, then they'll actually give us a call and just say, look, you know, we've given them all the textbook advice. We think you need to basically step in as franchisor because we haven't had necessarily employment matters that have reached the media, um, but they've been things that, you know, really if they had have reached the media, they wouldn't be received very well. And it's basically just a franchisee making a bad decision in the heat of the moment and just not thinking about it. You know, they've got so many phone numbers that they can ring and they just do it off the cuff and, you know, they're, they're, they're too um, proud to basically go back and, and sort of defend it afterwards. So they'd rather, you know, go to the tribunal and pay $10,000 just to take the higher ground, which is, you know, not something that we support them doing. Um, spend the extra one month, two months, three months, whatever it takes to get the job done properly. And I think that's really important. But like you said, they, they make decisions with emotions. And so what we really try and encourage that let's put a business brain on and a commercial brain, not the emotions, especially if they're a small business owner, that it is personal, it's natural, we're all humans. So to make sure that you try and uh, educate them that this is a commercial deal and it's business related and not to jump with emotions. And least last in the last minute or so, what about if you are met with a fair work claim? Any tips there? Yeah, um, so um, what I'd say is, look, you, you can do them yourself. You can get a lawyer involved. Um, having yourself set up and making it defensible is really important because the last thing you want to give is the conciliator where you're sitting at first instance in that telephone conciliator. Um, I find them to be pretty pro-employee. Um, even if they can get two weeks out of you, like that's a win. Um, so... Um, you've got to put on that, that commercial hat um, and be in that position to say, well, we did X, Y and Z. We met our obligations. That is the most important thing to be able to do um, in, those, in those meetings. And, yeah, and then um, it does unfortunately become a commercial thing because if you've got a highly litigious person on the other side, either self-represented or win, with those no win, no fee uh, law firms um, then sometimes it is a commercial deal is done simply that so you don't go to the expense of doing submissions witness statements and everything at the Fair Work Commission. Cool well thank you um, anyone with any last questions in the last minute before we wrap up all good well thank you thank you very much everyone thanks Jenna Joe and Lisa for presenting today and for feeling answering the questions Thanks to everyone for jumping on the, to the webinar and hopefully you've got something out of it. If you've got any other questions later on, feel free just to send us a message. Um, we're happy to jump on and answer any questions you've got. Um, as Rosie said at the start, we did record this, so um, we, we will send it round later on and we'll send some other information of you with that. But thank you very much. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce.
Thanks, guys. Bye.